Hello, I'm Liam Fogarty. You're watching Bay TV Liverpool. In a couple of months' time, we'll be having a general election, and it's reckoned to be the most interesting, intriguing and unpredictable election for some time. But don't take my word for that. Listen to our guest today. He is Professor John Tong of the Liverpool University Department of Politics. John, you're very welcome. Thank you. What makes this election in 2015 so intriguing, so unpredictable? Well, all elections are exciting. They're always my, my Christmas Eve. But this is particularly fascinating because, by and large, we've known who was going to win more recent elections. 1997, we knew who was going to win. 2001, 2005, and to some extent, 2010. We've no idea who's going to win this general election. It's the most unpredictable election that we've seen in a generation. I think that's what makes it particularly fascinating. But what makes it unpredictable? Why is this one so different from, you know, 92, 97, even 2010? Because in those elections, either Conservatives or Labour had a, had a clear lead in the polls. This time, the Conservatives and Labour are virtually identical uh, in the polls. Neither is really commanding a great deal of confidence from the great British public. There are fringe players, fringe parties like UKIP, who we don't know how they're going to perform. And of course, there's the nationalist parties like the SNP who are going to take seats, for example, from, from Labour. So it's all up for grabs. There are no certain outcomes from this general election. Do you think the fact that no one can quite predict uh, what is, what's going to happen will actually increase interest? Will people take, you know, pay more attention? Will more people vote, do you think? Well, I hope that more people vote than last time because only 63% of the British public voted at the last election. Now, this is going to be a close contest. Uh, every vote may potentially matter. You know, let's get this turnout back up towards the 70%. We're not going to go back to that era, that lovely era of the 80% plus turnout that we used to have. But we need to have more than two thirds of people voting this time, surely. We've got lots to talk about. We won't cover every aspect of the pre-election uh, period. But I want to talk about um, Scotland. Um, there was the historic referendum last year, enormous public interest, huge historically high turnouts. Will there be a Scotland effect on our election here in, in England and the North West? I think it's going to be a big Scotland effect because although the nationalists didn't get their way in the referendum, they lost out by 55% to 45%, so the Scots didn't vote for independence. That doesn't mean to say that the Scottish National Party has gone and hidden a corner. All the polling evidence suggests the Scottish National Party is going to do really, really well and at which party's expense? Well, Labour, because the Conservatives barely have a presence in Scotland. So the Labour Party may be harmed by the SNP, but what may happen come the 8th of May, the morning after the election, is Ed Miliband, as Labour leader, may be trying to overcome the losses of seats to the SNP and trying to do a deal with them to form a government. We have a strange situation at the moment where all three party leaders of the main parties in England don't seem to be terribly popular. Um, is it possible for an unpopular party leader to lead their party to an election victory? Well, the fact they're all so unpopular tends to cancel um, things out. You've got to go back to the 1970s, where the less popular leader of the big two won. A lady called Margaret Thatcher, whatever happened to her? She was less popular than Jim Callaghan in the 1979 election campaign. But the fact we've got to go back to the 1970s, so long ago, to find a less popular leader winning suggests that leadership popularity does matter. But the fact is that Cameron's ratings are low, that they're, they're better than Ed Miliband's, it should be said, and Nick Clegg's poll ratings are abysmal. So if it was on leadership popularity alone, Cameron would just about win, but only by default. And of course, we've got all these leaders' debates uh, to look forward to. No one seems quite certain how many there'll be, who'll be taking part and who won't be taking part. Um, do they matter? Well, first of all, I'm not sure these leaders' debates will uh, necessarily take place. Um, you can empty chair David Cameron if he doesn't turn up, but that will be tricky, potentially legally. Does it matter? Yes, it does matter. There's no doubt the Liberal Democrats did better last time than they might have done otherwise if it hadn't been for so-called Clegg mania. Not that it lasted uh, for very long at all after the election. Uh, and the fact is that Gordon Brown's poor performances during the leadership debates cost Labour what little chance they had at the last election. So yes, they do matter because look at the viewing figures for those leadership debates last time. They were huge. So even though people may profess to be um, uninterested in politics, they do tune in for these debates. We're hearing a lot about um, problems with voter registration. You can't vote at all if you're not on the register. And the signs are, not least in, in this part of the world, that tens of thousands of people have simply disappeared. What's going on there? Well, the system has changed in terms of voter registration. Previously, the head of household was responsible for putting the people within a house 
on the, on the register, which was fine if that person was interested in politics, they, they put them on, but if they weren't, they might not. So what the government said, we're going to move to individual registration. The difficulty with that is in student areas, and some of the, the, the seats in Liverpool have particularly big student areas, well, once upon a time, the Hall of Residence would register students en masse. Now it's up to the individual. Only the individual can register themselves. So the question is, what happens if that individual doesn't register him or herself? But what are the parties doing about that? The parties are encouraging uh, students and others to register, to get people on the electoral register. But the parties have got to be careful. Legally, they cannot just sign up a swathe of electors and get them on the register themselves. That is not allowed under electoral law. So the parties have got to be careful. All they can do is encourage and cajole, nothing more than that. We'll talk about uh, May's election you know, for the rest of the programme, but I just want to spool back a bit to the last election in 2010, a coalition, an historic coming together of two major parties for the first time since World War II. Um, and they said it would never work. It has, hasn't it? It has. I mean, people were writing the obituaries for the coalition within a few days of it being formed, saying this will never last. Now, you can argue it's been a loveless marriage, particularly over the last year, and they've stayed together for, for the sake of the MPs. But nonetheless, it's, the fact is, it's got through a programme of legislation. There's not much legislation going on at the moment, but for four years they did pass a lot of legislation. They agreed with the austerity measures. And the fact is, it's cost the Liberal Democrats more than it has the Conservatives. Look at the local council election results we've had over the last four years. It's the Liberal Democrats who've had the hammering, not the Conservatives. So there's been a big price that Nick Clegg has paid for joining a coalition. Mr Clegg is going to spend the next couple of months reminding everybody that actually things could have been an awful lot worse, that we, we kind of held the Tories in check. Is that a narrative that's going to, be allow, it's going to allow him to claw back some of those missing voters? I think Nick Clegg is soil political goods for the, for the infamous promise on tuition fees. He was politically naive. If you're going into coalition government, people would have said, fine, but you have to stick to what you've pledged in respect of university tuition fees because it was such a solemn pledge that he gave. He didn't. He caved in on that. And he spent too much time in government fussing about things that people frankly don't care about, like House of Lords reform. So, you know, the fact is Nick Clegg has been politically naive, even if history may be kind to him as doing the best for the country. And you've done some analysis with your colleagues at Liverpool University about the impact of the student vote on the Lib Dem vote. And it's not looking good for the party, is it? Well, the fact is an awful lot of that Lib Dem vote that was there in 2010 and indeed in 2005 was on basis of students transferring or previous Labour supporters transferring over to the Lib Dems. The Liberal Democrats cannot look forward to either of those two types of supporters coming behind them in 2015. They're, they are going to lose at least half their parliamentary seats on all the calculations we've made. I think it was Bill Clinton who made the phrase, it's the economy stupid, uh, famous as a kind of touchstone for political success. If you have a positive economic message, you tend to win elections. Um, is Labour about to go into an election saying it's the NHS stupid? Labour has no choice because the fact is Labour lost its reputation for economic competence during the previous parliament. So Labour has to campaign on where it's strong and Labour always leads the Tories on the NHS. They've got to try and drill home the message and involve, that does involve scaring the electorate over what the Conservatives will do to the NHS. So it's going to be in some ways an unedifying election campaign. But there are other issues swirling around. Um, benefits, the welfare system, uh, immigration, housing, perhaps, certainly in the south of England, perhaps not up here. Um, are they going to have an impact that could be decisive in the final vote? Well, immigration is always in the top five electoral concerns. And the fact is that the electors don't trust either of the big two parties on immigration. In terms of the economy, the Conservatives can say, look, we've got the deficit down, we've got low interest rates, low inflation, falling unemployment. So there is quite a good narrative for the Conservatives to offer there. But on the other hand, you've seen some swinging cuts in certain types of benefits. You've had massive cuts at local government, which people are feeling the pinch on. So therefore, you know, Labour's got to make headway and say there is a better, uh, there is a better way forward than simply cutting all the time. But people will ask Labour legitimately, where's the money coming from? And you talk about money. Uh, this is not going to be a kind of American style election with billions of pounds spent. But the parties are spending a lot of money, aren't they, on trying to reach the likes of you and me and get our votes? Well, I'd like to see a much tougher cap on election spending. Frankly, the, the, the parties are spending astronomical sums, which uh, the Conservatives can just about afford, Labour can't really afford, and they'll be running up a big deficit. I'd rather have state funding for political parties, but try selling that to Joe or Joanna taxpayer, saying actually 
from your taxes, you should fund political parties. People won't like that idea, full stop. I think Ken Clark, Ken Clark actually kind of came out a little bit as a, as a state funder at the weekend. Well, I think there's no option. Otherwise, you'll have this boring debate in which the Tories are accused of being funded simply by big business, often, you know, on, on dubious paying with, with dubious taxation policies. Labour, well, they're in hot to the, their trade union paymasters. That debate has been so sterile, it's gone on for years, and it'll never be resolved without state funding. And we heard a lot about social media, MPs have Twitter accounts using Facebook and so on. Is that going to be a key factor this time? For every, every each of the last three elections I've heard social media is going to dominate. Don't underestimate the importance of traditional methods of campaigning, knocking on the door. Successive studies have shown that matters. People like individual contact with their prospective MP. Well, we'll talk a little more about the actual campaign to come uh, when we return after this break. Hello, welcome back. I'm Liam Fogarty and I'm meeting Professor John Tong of Liverpool University's Politics Department. Um, John, let's have, a look, let's have a look at some of the runners and riders uh, in the forthcoming uh, general election steeplechase. Let's start with the Conservative Party. Um, they must be pretty bullish that having overseen an incredibly difficult period of austerity, their poll ratings are holding up and their economic ratings are holding up. What kind of shape is David Cameron in to take his party into this election period? Well, David Cameron's got a reasonable economic narrative to go to the country with. If you look at you know, low inflation, low interest rates, people beginning to feel better off. But it's not really been hugely reflected in the Conservatives' poll ratings. They haven't gone up that much. What has happened is Labour's have tended to slide downwards, uh, if, if anything. So there's still a big job for David Cameron to do. And let's face it, if, you know, there's an awful lot of people within the Conservative Party frustrated David Cameron didn't win an overall majority last time. Politically, he's finished if the Conservatives don't get a better result this time round. He spent much of the last five years looking over his shoulder at Nigel Farage and UKIP. Uh, what signs are there that UKIP are a real threat to sitting Conservatives in a way that might frankly scupper Mr Cameron's chances of forming a government? UKIP are a threat. If you look at some of the academic studies of UKIP, they suggest that they're taking votes equally off the Conservatives and Labour, but more recent evidence has suggested actually no, that's not true, the con that they're hitting the Conservatives more than they're hitting Labour. UKIP are also a threat in a small number of parliamentary constituencies. So there's, there's two effects. UKIP will win a few seats outright in all probability and defend their by-election successes, but they'll also take more votes from the Conservatives than they will from Labour in the seats that matter to the Conservatives. But there have been quite a few strong UKIP showings in, in by-elections in Labour heartlands, in places like South Yorkshire. Here we know that their deputy leader, Paul Nuttall, uh, is taking on Labour in their safest seat, statistically, which is brutal. Um, would they be better off using their resources to try and knock out Tories instead of knocking out Labour? Yes, yes, I think UKIP would be better off uh, spending money trying to knock out Tories. I don't think they're going to capture many current Labour held seats at all. But UKIP are a spoiler for the Conservative Party. The fact is the Conservatives have to deal with them. The Conservatives have offered a referendum on the EU because of the UKIP threat. They, th they thought that would see off UKIP. They were wrong. It simply strengthened UKIP in, in their determination to force through the European issue. So there's not much more David Cameron can do about UKIP this side of the general election. But in the northwest of England, they have a very strong representation uh, in the European Parliament. They've picked up a few council seats, not many. Do you honestly think that we could have a UKIP MP from Merseyside or South Lancashire or the northwest of England? UKIP won't win any parliamentary seats in the northwest. Of that, I'm supremely confident. They simply don't have enough strength. Their polling in the cities at local elections was very poor. Only 5% in Liverpool, 8% in Manchester. They're not strong enough. The closest they've come in the northwest was the Haywood and Middleton by-election. They got within 600 votes of Labour, and I suggest that's a high watermark for UKIP here in the northwest. So let's talk about Labour. They're looking uh, to, obviously, looking to uh, form a government. Can you really look at winning a general election with 35, 36% uh, uh, of the electorate uh, backing you, which is what the current polls are kind of looking, looking like? Well, once upon a time, it would have been impossible to form a government with only 35% of the vote, but Labour could do it um, somewhat freakishly by having an unusual rainbow coalition with groups like the SNP. Labour's got a make its appeal beyond its northwest heartland. It's fine piling up huge majorities in all the Liverpool inner city seats and the, and the Manchester ones, etc. But Labour's got to do a lot more than that. That's why Labour's campaign, if it's too NHS focused, will struggle. Labour's got to win back seats in the Shire. So you know, the five seats that were lost to the Conservatives in Lancashire 
at the 2010 election. Those have got to be the key targets for Labour. You've got to attract swing voters and you can't just bang on about the NHS all the time to achieve that. They're going to make a big effort in Wirral West, I imagine, where Esther McVeigh has become something of a kind of a, a hate figure uh, for Labour Party activists and, and many others, perhaps. Well, I think the fact that, that Wirral West is considered a marginal shows how toxic the Conservative brand has been on Merseyside for a number of years. Because if you look at the demographic profile of Wirral West and, and places like Hoylake and West Kirby, frankly, this should be a safe, Conservative seat. The fact it's marginal speaks volumes for the Conservatives' problems. I don't think Labour will take Wirral West off Esther McVeigh, but nonetheless, you know, the fact they're in the running uh, speaks volumes. I think Labour also needs to be careful that it doesn't lose Wirral South, which, remember, was only won by 500 votes by Alison McGovern last time. Labour's got to be careful there that they don't, by concentrating so much on Wirral West, you know, open the door to a Conservative revival there. But our signs aren't there that some Labour supporters are peeling away to support the Greens. Now, you say there's not a a chance of a UKIP uh, MP in this part of the world. I suspect the same is true of, of the Green Party. But will they be a factor in kind of peeling people away from Labour and damaging Labour's prospects in what might otherwise have been safe Labour seats? Well, the Greens are a natural repository for disaffected uh, Labour voters. And I think they will pick up some uh, beyond the cities. I think they'll pick up some disaffected Labour support. But the fact is they're not going to win any parliamentary seats. The Greens will be looking much more, although they won't say this publicly, at the local elections held on the same day, where, for example, fracking campaigns may also be of importance. And of course, here in Liverpool, they are the official uh, opposition with, I think, four councillors. And there's a lot of bad blood, isn't it, between the Greens in Lit Liverpool and the, the Liverpool Labour councillors. Um, <laughs> and if you look at the numbers, you think, well, what's your problem? Well, there's always bad blood in Liverpool politics. That's the nature of Liverpool politics. Oh, I had heard that, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, you, you'd, you'd struggle to find an era when, when there wasn't. Um, it is. I mean, the, the Greens are, are, are like a little nuisance to Labour because they do try and hold the all-powerful, all-dominant uh, Labour ruling group to account. And I think, you know, f for that, we, knew, we need to thank the Greens because they do enhance local democracy because otherwise, where would the scrutiny come? It might come from the small Liberal Party that exists on Liverpool City Council, but we'd be struggling otherwise. Um, it's almost hard to imagine that uh, the Liberal Democrats were far and away the biggest party on Liverpool City Council as recently as five, six years ago. Um, and now they have, I think, three councillors on the local authority. In parliamentary terms, looking ahead to this general election, where are the Liberal Democrats going to hold seats and is there any chance at all they might gain any? They'll hold seats where they've got popular local MPs. There's always a big incumbency effect for the Liberal Democrats. So, close to home, Southport, would be an area I would expect the Liberal Democrats to hold on. I expect John Pugh to hold his seat there. Where they're going to struggle is in places like Hazel Grove, where Andrew Stunnell, the sitting MP, uh, is stepping down. So I'd expect the Liberal Democrats in total to lose half their seats. They've had catastrophic local election results in this region. You know, they've lost 60% of their councillors, more in the big cities, Liverpool and Manchester. It's a higher percentage. So you, you see you know, the problems of the Liberal Democrats, and I don't think there's a way back for them. Uh, you mentioned John Pugh in Southport. Um, UKIP has made a pretty strong showing in that kind of seat. Um, is John Pugh banking on a strong UKIP showing to keep the Conservatives uh, at bay? Yeah, there's enough disaffected Conservatives prepared, even at a general election, to vote UKIP, to help the Liberal Democrats win by default in many ways. Don't underestimate the damage that UKIP have done, not just to the Conservative Party in terms of votes, but in terms of party membership. People disaffected over issues like gay marriage. It's not just about UKIP's immigration policy. There's a certain social conservatism there that has forced people out of the Conservatives in, into UKIP. As you say, the election is too close to call. Yes, you can predict with you know, some certainty individual uh, contests, but really everything is up for grabs. Let's look to the day after the general election and nobody has an outright majority and, and, and play some games because I imagine you and your colleagues in the politics department at the university do that all the time. Uh, flesh out a scenario whereby neither David Cameron nor Ed Miliband is our next Prime Minister. Well, I think the first thing to look for is which is the largest party in terms of parliamentary seats, because I think there will lie you know, the likelier party to, to help form the government. So if David Cameron's got the, the largest party in terms of seats, he will look then for the Liberal Democrats first of all, that rump of Liberal Democrats that's left, probably about 27 seats. Then, you know, the DUP in Northern Ireland would be perhaps natural bedfellows for the Conservatives. Uh, UKIP. You know, the, although they've said they won't go into uh, any sort of formal coalition with the Conservatives, you know, they could be persuaded over the timing of an EU referendum. So it's just about possible David Cameron may cobble things together. 
there's an even unlikely a rainbow coalition on the Labour side because Labour would probably have to do business not just with the Liberal Democrats, who they've been spent five years heavily criticising, but also with the Scottish National Party, who's going to have a big rump of former Labour seats. So you, know, you have a unionist party in effect and a nationalist party. What can Labour offer at the SNP? Lots of more money for Scotland, no doubt. Now, one of your areas of expertise is actually Irish politics. And of course, there will be, you mentioned DUP uh, MPs, there'll be nationalists and Republican members of parliament as well. Um, can you flesh out a scenario whereby people like Gerry Adams uh, or Martin McGuinness are involved in, in, in the making of the next UK government? Well, Sinn Féin currently hold five seats. They hope to get that up to about six at this coming, coming election. But they don't swear an oath of allegiance to the Queen, so they don't take their seats at Westminster. Now, that's a tactic rather than a fundamental principle for Sinn Féin, but they can't turn that round very quickly. So they won't be involved in the coalition making negotiations. That We need a special conference and a two-thirds majority within the party to change the stance so they would take seats at Westminster. And you'd have to find a party leader in the UK who was willing to negotiate with them. Well, <laughs> well. well I don't think that would be the problem. I, I think Cameron and Miliband will, will find, that's, that's will make friends worried. out of enemies without any difficulty whatsoever. But nonetheless, it won't happen quickly enough for, for, in terms of coalition making. We only have a few seconds left. Between now and polling day in May, what kind of things should we look out for to give us a clue to who's going to win this thing? It's going to be a very bitter election. It'll get personal. You've already heard Miliband getting personal with Cameron on, on issues like tax. Expect more of the same. One of the dirtiest campaigns I think we'll have seen in modern political history. Plenty to look forward to then, Jonathan. <laughs> John Tong, Professor of Politics at Liverpool University, thank you so much for talking to us. I'm Liam Fogarty. See you soon.